Good morning, and uh, happy Earth Day celebration to all. We're just a few days late for the official celebration, but we can celebrate Earth any day of the year. I'm Ed Sharples, your worship associate for this morning's service. Celebrants this morning include worship associate and colleague Brianna Zamborski, Cantor Keith Ellison, Talis Leiters, Tanya and Amelia Nordhaus, opening words from Annette and Eric Sargent, homilies from Mary Dunn and Jane O'Neill, and closing words from Annis Pratt. Mary Jo Ebert and Rika de Graff are providing technical support. It is our pleasure to be here with you today in community, virtual as it is, as we take time to look both outwardly and within ourselves. Birmingham Unitarian Church is a welcoming congregation, a designation earned by the congregation and conferred by the Unitarian Universalist Association. We turn our social work for this year into four categories civic engagement, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental action. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 10.30 and later posted on Facebook. After the service, we invite you to remain with us for a virtual coffee hour. If you are worshiping with us for the first time, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope you will stay after service so that we can get to know you better and you can get to know some of us. We do not require or teach one mode of theology. Instead, we celebrate diversity, diversity in belief, and we worship together in community. If you have found a spiritual home in BUC, we encourage you to discuss a path to membership with Brianna Zimborski, our membership chair. So thank you for bringing us into your circle today or whenever you watch this. We may not be together physically, but we are together in spirit, and it is good to be together again. And now, with music, our worship begins. morning. The flowering trees and bushes, the smell of soil on a rainy day, air with which to fill our lungs with the scent of lilacs, the natural wonders of our geological land formations, a state full of great lakes, abundant food, clean water for us to drink on a hot summer day, rocks on which to climb, 
trees for squirrels and birds to sit in, gardens full of flowers and vegetables and butterflies. This is our list of Earth's blessings. We encourage you to think for a moment of what makes you smile when you think of our Earth's blessings. Please join us in singing our opening hymn, number 1066, O Brother Son. The, uh, the words are from a prayer of Francis of Assisi, who in the Catholic tradition is recognized as being a patron saint of animals and of the environment. He was a 12th century spiritual leader, a contemporary in many ways with Rumi on the other side of the Mediterranean. Um, please, it's not a song that we often do, but give it a try. Try to sing along as you can. We won't hear any of your mistakes, but you get to hear mine. This is a poem, Beginners, by Denise Levertov. But we have only begun to love the earth. We have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How could we tire of hope? So much is in the bud. How can desire fail? We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy, only begun to envision how it might be to live as siblings with beast and flower not as oppressors. Surely our river cannot already be hastening into the sea of non-being. Surely it cannot drag in the silt all that is innocent. Not yet, not yet. There is too much broken that must be mended, too much hurt we have done to each other that cannot yet be forgiven. We have only begun to know the power that is in us if we would join our solitudes in the communion of struggle. So much is unfolding that must complete its gesture. So much is in the bud. The offering is a physical symbol of church life. It is a statement of gratitude for all that life provides, for the struggles and for the joys along the way 
and for a caring community of confidence. The mission of BUC is to create a free and welcoming religious community, one that encourages lives of integrity, of learning, of service, and of joy. In support of this mission, your financial gift can be received as a check in the mail or by using Venmo. And now the music for the office. Join me in reflection, followed by a brief time for silent meditation. We have come through a difficult year. We have been kept apart physically, often kept apart from those we love. We have, however, engaged friends, family members, truth, even worship itself, virtually. Individually, we may have suffered illness and pain, isolation and sadness. And we have known those conditions in others as well. In the words of Blake, we were made for joy and war. Today, we celebrate the earth. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have increasingly insulted the air we breathe. We have insulted the water we drink. We have insulted the soil that nourishes. May healing of the earth go beyond intentions and prayer. May healing through the actions of individuals, of corporations, of government, be informed by science as the foundation for renewal 
and sustainability. Please take these things in mind now for just a few moments. May it be. Brianna Zamborski. Can you see me? Someone give me a thumbs up. Okay, I'm not seeing myself, so that's confusing. Um, I'm uh, going to read a story today. I don't think we have too many young people, but I am one of those that believe that picture books are for all ages, so that's not a problem. Um, when I was asked to uh, read a story for the Earth Day service, I looked at all the books that I had, um, and then I checked out a bunch uh, for pickup at the library, and then I even went to uh, Masked Up. I went to BookBeat in Oak Park, a uh, local bookstore, and I read um, tons and tons of books that they had, and I found lots of good ones, but um, I ended up with this one, and it's probably um, the least likely selection because it doesn't really have anything to do with nature or the environment or climate change or the things you would think uh, an Earth Day book would be about, but it just struck the right chord for me. And so I hope it does for you as well, um, particularly for this year's Earth Day. So it is called, also, if you can get your hands on it, um, you know, the illustrations are amazing and the pictures show up better in person, but um, you'll, get, you'll get a good enough idea. Um, so it's called, if You Come to Earth by Sophia Blackall. Oh, I know why I'm not seeing myself because I don't have myself on, I have the wrong view, sorry. Here we go. Dear visitor from outer space, if you come to Earth, here's what you need to know. You can find us near a big sun and a tiny moon and a bunch of other planets. Ours is the greeny blue one. The green and brown bits are land and the blue stuff is water. People mostly live on the land in big cities and small towns and tiny villages, or just in the middle of nowhere.
We live in all kinds of homes. In all kinds of families. There are more than 7 billion people on earth. We all have bodies, but every body is different. Except for my friends who are identical twins and look the same, except for a Mustafa's mole. You see it? Inside our heads, we are usually thinking. You can't see our thoughts, but sometimes we show our feelings on our faces. Even if we don't feel like it, we get dressed every day. We wear different clothes depending on what we do and where we live and if it's hot or cold. There's different kinds of weather in the world. Some of it's good and some of it's bad. Wherever people live, we're usually always going someplace else. There are lots of ways to get there. I'm a kid and kids go to school to learn stuff so we know what to do when we're grown up. Grown ups do lots of things to make the world work. When people are not at work or at school or sick or asleep, we get to do whatever we want. Whatever we are doing, we need to eat when we are hungry. Some of us have more food than others. We all need food and water to survive. We get water from the rain, which flows into little streams and big rivers and all the way to the sea. You can't drink the sea because it's too salty. The sea looks empty, but actually it's full. Fish can swim, but they can't walk. Most animals can walk or swim or gallop or hop, but they can't fly. Some birds can swim and walk and fly. So if I had to choose, I'd be a bird. Birds can also sing. So can whales and people. People make all kinds of music on our own and all together. Some of us who are deaf talk with our hands and our faces. Some of us who are blind read with our fingers. If we are blind, we can imagine colors as shapes and sounds. These are the colors you need to paint everything in the world. Some of these names are amazing. Also, they have um, slug belly, leftovers, dog tongue. These are just a few that I liked. Some things are part of nature. Some things are made by humans. Some things are big, some things are small.
Some things are invisible. Sometimes we hurt each other. It's better when we help each other. Babies are not very good at anything. Kids are good at lots of things. Grown-ups can do just about everything until they are really, really old. But by then, the babies are grown up and can help. Older people are good at telling stories about the world when they were young. Kids are good at making up stories that haven't happened yet. There are lots of things we don't know. We don't know where we were before we were born or where we go when we die. But right this minute, we are here together on this beautiful planet. If you come to Earth, you can stay in my room. Love, Quinn. So as you can see, it isn't a book about Earth Day, but it's a book about Earth and um, told through the eyes of and seen through the eyes of our young narrator, Quinn. I couldn't help but re-see just how amazing it is and so I think the, the message that um, I hope it gives and that the author was intending is um, that we should do everything we can to protect it and take care of it and take care of each other. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you, Brianna. That was a perfect selection for Earth Day. And um, I keep hearing messages about all the animals and all the beings on earth today. So that works right in with what I'm going to read about. Um, over the past couple of years, my interest in indigenous people and the lessons we can learn from them has been growing. So I recently discovered Robin Wall Kimmerer, and I wanted to share some of what I've learned from her so far and from others. Dr. Kimmerer is a botanist, an enrolled member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation and also a mother and a poet and author. As a Potawatomi, Kimura was raised with many indigenous practices, including the practices of the Honorable Harvest. As a botanist, she's a PhD at the State University of New York, where she's also a distinguished teaching professor of environmental biology. Kimura learned about the scientific side of relationships that she already understood from her upbringing with what she calls a different way of knowing. Much of that way of knowing is understanding the interdependence and the interactions of plants with plants, plants with animals and insects, and humans with nature. This interdependence shows up among first world peoples as a culture of reciprocity. Kimura shares a ritual that happens in many indigenous nations that she calls the Thanksgiving address and is also called the words that come before all else. These words are recited at the beginning and ending of many gatherings and their purpose is to set gratitude as the highest priority. But it's a full serving of gratitude, which means that it includes responsibility for reciprocating with one's own gift. The ritual describes gratitude to the various parts of the earth for giving what they give, even though it's their responsibility to give it. It starts out like this. Today we have gathered, and when we look upon the faces around us, we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and with all living things. So now let us bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. This address goes on at some length, thanking Mother Earth, the waters, fish, plant life, trees, animals, birds, the four winds, 
lightning and thunder, the sun, the moon, stars, enlightened teachers, and finally the creator. It names what gifts are received from each of these non-human entities and gives thanks for their existence and continued fulfillment of the needs of others. Each part of creation is thanked in turn for fulfilling its creator given duty to the others. Now, sometimes I hear the phrase, do your job with the implication that if you're getting paid for something that that's all you should expect. No appreciation or gratitude or reciprocity will be forthcoming. Similarly, we often understand duty as being one-sided, the responsibility of the doer, but something that the beneficiary simply receives or maybe doesn't even notice. But duty and money are hollow substitutes for the real connection that real gratitude brings. This culture of reciprocity is in contrast to what we in our dominant culture have, which is a culture of acquisition. A culture of acquisition creates emptiness and need, which keeps crying out to be fulfilled over and over. Because it isn't really what we need, it's never satisfying. We continue to acquire physical belongings, but the satisfaction is fleeting. We have so much stuff we don't even want. We have to hire people to help us organize and throw our excess stuff away. We have whole industries that sell our excess stuff, some of it never having even been used. Sometimes we think we can justify this behavior for being grateful for having so much. I've been part of this myself in conversations with friends where we stop and say to each other, oh, we're so fortunate. Now, it's not a bad thing to appreciate the comfort we have, but this cheap gratitude is weak. It can even be toxic. It's a way to paper over negative things, to make everything fine, to make the speaker feel better about their part in the inequities in the world, to avoid having to take responsibility or to change our own lives at all. Al Gore says that false hope is a form of denial. And I think this kind of gratitude is a form of denial as well. Real gratitude comes with the responsibility to reciprocate. It's a give and take, just like a healthy relationship with another person. It takes self-reflection and knowing ourselves, and that takes really knowing the other, not seeing the earth or nature as an inanimate object, but as a living, breathing being. Kimmerer asks us to consider, what do you think might happen if we believed that the earth loved us back? Knowing that you love the earth changes you, activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms the relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. Noticing and expressing gratitude for everything the earth gives us is an important step into that different way of knowing that the earth loves us, knowing it with our hearts as well as our heads. So how do we reciprocate? On a personal level, what does the earth need or want from us? We need to be in a relationship with our habitat in order to know how to reciprocate. We also need to be aware of our own gifts, whatever talents or abilities or resources we have that can be of use to mother nature. In describing the honorable harvest, Kimmerer describes various ways to reciprocate. It may be for at, by asking for what you want before taking it, and taking no for an answer. It might be taking only what you need instead of everything you can hold. It might be a gift of art or ceremony to help others express, acknowledge, express acknowledgement and appreciation. It might be listening, listening to the words of others expressing their gratitude, or our gift might be to stop talking and to start listening to nature and all that she has to say to our hearts. Good morning, my name is Mary. And it strikes me that since the dawn of human consciousness, nature has had the potential to be a source of inspiration. Sometimes fear or mystery are possibly a reflection of God, big G or little g. What is nature to you? What do you sense in your backyard? When you visit the Great Lakes, or gaze at this year's spring bloom. Do you have a nature connection? Not everyone does. 
I personally have a hard time explaining my connection to nature. Perhaps my brain chemistry has something to do with it. Whatever the case, my experience is different from a family member who views cocktails on the deck as communion with mother nature. To each their own. For me, there is a sense of awe and comfort when I'm outdoors. And this moves me to preserve nature for generations to come. I want to share the glories of the planet and the views of the heavens. At the same time, I view our economy as a subsidiary of the earth, which supplies raw materials and crops. So the frugal part of me wants to ensure there are resources and groceries for the future. Our congregation and many of us as individuals continue to learn about and to act on behalf of our earthly home. This work will continue for years. Will we have the juice to sustain us for the long haul? Perhaps nature itself can provide some support. Consider creativity which can stoke our environmental activism. Can we look at the diversity of plants, animals, water, and stone to challenge ourselves to be innovative? Dr. Catherine Hayhoe states that the most important thing we can do about climate is talk about it. Have we discussed climate with family or friends in the last week? In the last month, what creative approaches might we use to chat about this critical issue? Dr. Hayhoe suggests looking for shared values to anchor a conversation. First, listen to others respectfully, attentively. Connect where that person is. Be creative to identify the hook to initiate conversation then speak with authenticity. As an agnostic, biblical quotes from me about creation care would ring hollow to an evangelical Christian, and rightly so. Does your neighbor remark about early weeds this spring? If so, point out how climate change is lengthening the growing season. Do you share a love of beer or exquisite coffee with family? Check how altered weather impacts a crop of hops needed for beer or shade for coffee plants. Are you sharing a box of Kleenex with another allergy sufferer? You may point out that carbon pollution and warmer temperatures cause plants to produce more pollen over a longer growing season. And while you're at it, please pass the Benadryl. Tenacity is another one of nature's attributes. Consider the bristlecone pine, a small tree native to the Rockies. It grows at elevations above 5,500 feet, where temperatures drop below freezing and growing seasons sometimes are so short, there can be no earth growth ring for a particular year. Yet bristlecone pines are among the oldest living organisms on earth, thousands of years old. Now that is tenacity. We don't have thousands of years to address climate change or the next extinction, but our tenacity to address these issues will in part determine our success. What does tenacity look like? One option is to contact federal, state, and local lawmakers to communicate concerns and what we want done. Remember, these office holders work for us, the voters. Communication can include meeting with a member of Congress or their staff. It can be an email. Legislators are more impressed when they receive a handwritten letter or even a postcard. Submit a letter to the editor of a local paper. And don't forget the ever handy telephone. After today's service, we will share a tool with a monthly reminder and script for phone calls. Just stay in the main meeting room 
to learn more about this easy climate outreach. Tenacity also means repeating this communication multiple times a year, not just during campaign season and no matter which party holds the office. It also means thanking legislators who have supported climate action. What other inspiration does the earth provide to support our climate activism? I like to consider beauty. Beauty includes the geometry of a pine cone, soft hues of apple blossoms, and the melodies of bird song, to name just a few. Beauty is abundant. Taking time to surround ourselves with nature can buoy us when we are weary and recharge our batteries. It can provide a rest, a meditative break. So turn off the digital devices, walk away from the TV, put aside cares about viruses and politics, go ahead and putter in the garden, visit a park or head out on a bike. Allow the array of earthly delights to bless us with peace, creativity, and tenacity for the work ahead. Amen and blessed be. But wait just one minute. Don't turn off those digital devices just yet because we have a little bit of audience participation right now. We're going to create a word cloud in Mentimeter. You're gonna need a second digital device for this. Uh, whatever you're watching us on today, your computer or your iPad or your phone, you'll need a second device. So on that device, go to your internet browser, Safari or Google or whatever you use. And in the search bar, type what's on the screen, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Then hit go or return. Now, if this is too complicated and it just isn't working, don't worry, just sit back and watch your screen. Uh, it'll just take a minute. So once you type in, um, uh, once you open up Mentimeter, then you have to type in this code 74876935 and submit. And it'll give some um, uh, fields that you can enter a word into. So I'm gonna do mine right now, if it'll let me do I guess it's not letting me doing it. But go ahead and Mary Jo is going to show the screen and we'll see what everybody's going to, who everybody's going to talk to this week about the earth. Oh, here we go. Well, that's Mari Manugian is my representative and there's a bill in the Michigan legislature about raising the cap on solar that I'm hearing that she might vote no on. So I'm gonna be calling her tomorrow. County commissioner, love it. Family and friends, family and friends, family and friends. Offspring, excellent. Coworkers, grandchildren, my family, perfect. Beautiful, everyone. Sounds like we all have some great ideas on who to talk to. And um, I know that if we're all working on this together, we will be able to solve this. And that's not false hope, that's true hope. So now we're gonna sing a traditional UU hymn that you know very well, Blue Boat Home. Never harbor or port 
have I known? The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat home. starry sea leaning over the edge in wonder casting questions into the deep planting here with my ship's companions all we kindred pilgrim souls making our way by the lights of the heavens in our beautiful blue I give thanks to the waves upholding me, hail the great winds urging me on, greet the infinite sea before me, sing the sky my sailor's song. I was born upon the fathoms, never harbor or port have I known. The wide universe is the ocean I travel, and the earth is my blue boat home. As we go forth in gratitude for all that our beloved planet has given us, I would like us to take in our hearts this Gaelic blessing, which is about all that the planet does for us to hold us in its heart. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the gentle night to you. Moon and stars pour their healing light on you. Deep peace to you. May it be so. Amen. Shalom and blessed be. <laughs>